Hocus Pocus, Alan Today's Cocos. show, it's for everyone. Today's special, come join in the fun. With magic everywhere, a world for us to share. And friendly faces, hoping that you want to meet us there. Today's special, it's about to appear, it's about to appear. Today's special, shout it loud and clear. Today's special. Today's special is fun. This episode is brought to you by Patreon. Patreon, kid tested, mother approved. The story of Nickelodeon is a story of an intersection between two interests the ongoing development of children's media, and the spread and evolution of the cable television market. But Nickelodeon wasn't the only version of that story. There were other places, other companies trying to figure out that same question for themselves at roughly the same time. And sometimes these stories paralleled each other in some interesting ways. We've discussed Pinwheel, Nickelodeon's premier show, and even three years in, the show Warner Amex tried to sell the channel with a show that PBS and the Children's Television Workshop had a significant influence on, its staff full of electric company alumni, its format lifted from Sesame Street. But unlike those shows, Pinwheel was less interested in teaching kids letters and numbers, but instead focusing on its characters and their relationships as they sang and danced in a small environment. A few years after Nickelodeon's premiere, a show very similar to Pinwheel made its debut, it, too, was a show, aimed at a preschool crowd, about singing and dancing relationships. It, too, was a show developed for a cable company by children's television alumni as a killer premiere app for a new cable package. But instead of the American markets, we're heading north, to a magical land known as Canada, where in 1981, Today's Special was born. What you doing, Jody? Oh, hi, Jeff. There's a big hat sale in the store tomorrow, and I have to get everything ready. Anything I can do? Sure. I have to go to the basement to get some tools. Suppose you go around the store and gather up all the hats you can find. I'd really appreciate it. No problem. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Okay, let's see. All the hats I can find. Ah, here we are. Hats. <laughs> hats. Hats. Nothing very hard about this. Something wrong? These aren't hats? Oh. Maybe I better look up hats in the What Is It book. Today's special tells the story of four people having adventures and learning things in a department store after closing up for the night. There's Jody, the overnight display designer. Oh, I forgot completely. Well, I promised Muffy that we'd picnic in the park and then we'd go to the dinosaur exhibit at the museum, but I can't go. I've got this big exam. Oh, I can't miss it. How am I going to tell Muffy? Sam Crenshaw, the night security guard, looking over things with the help of his supercomputer, TXL. Hey, looky here. <laughs> Five toes. Well, what do you think made that track? Yeah, if you said raccoon, I think you're right. Just must have lifted up that trap door and walked right in. Well, now all I got to do is figure out a way to catch that critter. And Muffy, a tiny mouse who always speaks in rhyme. Oh, I really want to do my best so we can win this singing test. Any song we choose is fine, but I sure hope they choose mine. A thousand dollars is the prize. Imagine all the cheese that buys. Why, it would last me my whole life long. <laughs> you know, I think I'll write a happy song. And, with a magic hat and a couple of secret words, the three of them bring one of the store's mannequins to life. This is Jeff, a singing, dancing child in a grown man's body. Since he's not allowed to leave the store and is only alive a few hours every night, he doesn't know a lot about the world. And it's up to Jody, Sam, and Muffy to teach him about the basic concepts of existence. I warn you, Sheriff. This town's not big enough for both of us. Oh, Jody, Jody, get back. Oh, hi, get Jack. Jody. 
You mean it was the TV all the time? Yeah, I've been watching the late movies trying to get some ideas for today's special. Today's special is guns? No, no, today's special is Wild West. Wow. So we're trying to make everything look like it did a long time ago. Wild West. Learning letters, numbers, shapes, that kind of thing did happen on occasion, but the show was more focused on introducing Jeff to broader life experiences, like tasting fruit for the first time, or growing plants, and what things float and what things sink. Sometimes these lessons would evolve into magical adventures. Uh-oh, the Queen of Hearts has left the storybook, and she thinks Jeff stole the royal tarts. Jeff? Jeff? Well, yes. The, I found the tarts in the stockroom. I mean, the knave must have left them there. Are you saying that I, the famous Queen of Hearts, am mistaken? Yeah, and you're wrong, too. Other reoccurring characters included Walter the Magnificent, the magician that brought Jeff to life in the first place, Mrs. Pennypacker, who works the stockroom during the night shift, and Mort, Muffy's visiting cousin from the country. There were also cutaway segments. Jody asking questions to the audience, like which of these things don't belong, children reading storybooks, and the mime lady. Yes, much like Pinwheel, today's special had its own designated mime. That was probably the main selling point for Nickelodeon. They loved mimes back in the early 80s. Here are three piles of books. Which pile of books is the highest? Is it this pile of books, this pile, or this pile? Today's special made its Canadian television premiere in 1981, and while it may seem quaint by most standards, this show was actually a huge gamble for its producers, TV Ontario. For those of us filthy non-Canadians not in the know, TV Ontario is pretty similar to the public broadcasting system of the United States. A crown corporation owned by the government of Ontario, TVO is publicly funded and focused on educational programs. In the late 1960s, Ontario's then Minister of Education, Bill Davis, had been developing the implementation of television programs as part of a classroom curriculum, creating an independent Ontario Educational Community Authority in 1970, and with it, TV Ontario. <laughs> I'm very proud and happy to announce the opening of Channel 19. Since Channel 19 is designed to meet the needs of all citizens in its viewing area, from preschoolers through to adults, the Ontario government felt that it was appropriate to establish a special authority to administer and coordinate policies both for this channel and for educational communications throughout the province. The nucleus of the staff of the authority is made up of a number of professional educators and broadcasters. We have thus, I believe, the ideal amalgam of the educator and the broadcaster who should produce for you the kinds of programs that you will find stimulating and useful. Producing content for TV Ontario was a considerable affair, as everything had to be worked through well-defined instructional objectives and curriculum guidelines, while also being, you know, good. Production was split into five areas, preschool, adult, university, French language, and teacher education. And with so much open space, a lot of television people started crawling out of the woodwork. Ideas for programs bombard the superintendents from all sorts of places. People come in off the streets to propose series ideas. Television people wander through the offices daily, trying to sell somebody an idea. But all proposals are cataloged, assessed on their educational merits, and brought before programming committees composed of a wide range of experts in their respective fields. One of these creatives to come off the streets was Clive Vanderberg. With a master's degree in communication from Syracuse University in New York and an associate of the Royal Conservatory of Music in Toronto, where he played the piano, from that education, Vanderberg began making his way into television. Educational television was a relatively new operation at that time. I mean, I think it started in 67, but it was still fairly young. And uh, I was lucky enough because of the performance background, the academic background, uh, to be hired by them to help out on some shows. I'll give you some idea of how I, how I started out. My first day on the job, I was uh, three-hole punching scripts. So I don't think you needed a master's degree for that, but I learned an awful lot by being surrounded by, you know, phenomenally talented, creative people. Vanderberg began in the teacher education department, but soon became interested in transferring to the preschool area, making television for little kids. 
There was room open for a new show for TVO's Saturday morning block, so Vandenberg pitched a show about ecology and the environment, where a moose and a beaver reporter would explore the topics in a way that engaged with young children. The Children's Underground Club of United Moose and Beaver for Ecological Respect, or Cucumber for short. However, it was decided that ecology, well, a nice topic, was too narrow to build an entire show around, so ecological respect was changed to enthusiastic reporters, and the characters talked about other science and history subjects. Cucumber ran for two seasons beginning in 1974, with reruns going into the 1980s. Through the show, Vandenberg was able to connect with some pretty creative people that would follow him into today's special, including writer Joanne Hauser and performer and puppeteer Nikki Tilrow, who played the beaver character in Cucumber and was the mime lady in today's special. Cucumber's modest success made Vandenberg a reliable creative figure for the TV Ontario team. Next, Vandenberg worked on a couple of math shows, Math Patrol in 1977, aimed at grades 1-3, about a math detective putting on disguises and wandering about solving basic math problems, and Math Makers in 1978, aimed at grades 4-6, through six, about a company you go to to solve issues of graphs and measurements and such. So, being a reliable company man, Vanderberg found himself in the meeting room in 1979 when TV Ontario was made a very interesting offer. Enter Rogers Cable, a division of Rogers Communication Incorporated. In 1960, Ted Rogers Jr., a 27-year-old law student and son of a vacuum tube entrepreneur, bought the Toronto radio station KHFI-FM, and from that slowly began to build up a telecommunications and mass media assets company. In 1967, Rogers Communications broke into the cable television business. The story of cable television in Canada is pretty similar to that of the United States. Originally, it was just a service to get standard broadcast television into areas that were difficult to reach over the air. But as we entered the 1970s, people started floating the idea of, hey, what if we had channels exclusive to cable? In 1979, the same year Nickelodeon made its premiere, Rogers Cable purchased its main competitor, Canadian Cable Systems Limited, and in doing so became the biggest cable company in the country. It was time for Rogers to air exclusive material. And you know what would be a good idea? A channel of educational children's programming. So much like how Nickelodeon turned to PBS for content, Rogers Cable looked towards TV Ontario. Rogers Television, Rogers Cable, went to TV Ontario and said, we'd like to partner with you. We'd like you to bundle together a bunch of children's programs and put them in a package that we can play exclusively on uh, Rogers Cable. And what they did is they gave TV Ontario uh, money to repackage existing shows you know, Cucumber and Math Patrol and Math Makers and Read Along and Read All About It and Polka Dot Door and that, those kind of shows. Dear Aunt Agnes, I think, the Heather Conkey show. And then there was a bunch of money uh, for original French programming and original English programming. The plan was to create a station called Galaxy that would air educational programming all across the country. TV Ontario was, of course, limited to the Ontario province, hence the name. But with Galaxy, we could share Cucumber with our friends in Vancouver and Calgary and, um, hang on, gonna check Google Maps, uh, Yellowknife, probably. And Rogers Cable was interested in giving TV Ontario over a million dollars in funding to create original programming for their Galaxy project. So TVO asked Vanderberg to brainstorm a number of pitches for new shows. Why, with that money, we could make six or seven programs of a cucumber quality. Vandenberg had something else in mind. I, uh, I went away and did some, did some thinking about it, and I said, I, I have a different proposal for you. I'd like to do one blockbuster show. Rather than do five shows, I'd like to take that money and create one show and do a block of programs for that show and that would really have a, a significant impact in the marketplace. Because it's one of the problems that we had at TV Ontario. You know, you did six shows or eight shows or nine shows or something like that, and then they're over. If you want to have an impact in a marketplace, you want to have a show that, uh, that's going to be on regularly. And so my proposal was that we spend that money, do 40 shows, 
We shoot the shows, we go to air when we have 40 shows complete. If we did them Tuesdays and Thursdays, we'd have 20 weeks of original programming, which would create the sense that, you know, there was just an unlimited amount of programming. Vandenberg didn't actually have a show to pitch, not yet. Just the idea of making one expensive show instead of six cheap shows. So Vandenberg went to work, doing extensive market research, talking to other children's television producers in Canada and the United States, including the Children's Television Workshop. I went to New York. I, I, I talked to the people at the Children's Television Workshop's heads of research. I, I talked to uh, the pr executive producer of Captain Kangaroo. I talked to the people at, at Mr. Rogers. I talked, you know, I, I talked to, you know, some people at, uh, at uh, WGBH in Boston. And so that was part of the research that we did in order to try to take the best from all opportunities and then create something special. Now, just because today's special was getting a lot of money and was being produced with countrywide distribution in mind, didn't mean it was going to step away from the TV Ontario family. One of the channel's longest running shows was The Polka Dot Door, which had a frequent rotating cast of hosts two of whom Vanderberg grabbed for this new project, Nina Keough and Nirene Virgin. Nina Keough had gotten involved in puppetry for children's television at a very early age. Her father, John Keough, played the Howard the Turtle character for the CBC show Razzle Dazzle, and she followed in his footsteps, becoming a regular performer for TVO both in front of the camera and behind a puppet. I was uh, phoned uh, by, I, I don't know if it was Clive or not, and said, um, we're doing a show, uh, and and we want you to. I'd like you to uh, play the one of the characters. It wasn't a matter of auditioning. I didn't audition at all. It was just he called me and said, "I want you to do this." And uh, wow, you know, like that's fabulous. So that happens in this business, I tell you. Nirene Virgin had begun her career as a teacher before moving into television taking small roles such as a dispatcher on Police Surgeon. Eventually, she made her way into the TV Ontario family, hosted the Polka Dot Door for a while, then was picked up by Vanderberg to play Jody. Vanderberg wasn't just assembling talents from other TV Ontario projects, he was also assembling characters. A few years prior, TVO had produced a pilot for a show called Music Inc. One of the puppet characters for it was an older gentleman named Sam Crenshaw a puppet designed by Noreen Young and performed by Bob Dermer. But Sam Crenshaw was the, was the lead character in, uh, in Music Inc. with the Canadian Brass. And so I had had that experience with him, so I knew he was a wonderful performer. I knew he was, uh, I thought the character would work. And so I thought, well, Music Inc. wasn't extended into a series, so we would, uh, we would take that character and add one more puppet. That just left the show's star, and for that, Vanderberg would finally look outside TVO. Enter Jeff Hislop. Hislop had made a name for himself in Canadian musical theater, and for playing one of the anonymous apostles in Jesus Christ Superstar, which was landing him television performances, showing off his dancing talents to instrumentals from the show. Clearly an extraordinarily talented performer who would allow for some enthralling performances, Hislop was also given the role of the show's dance choreographer. For my money, this is what made today's special such a unique production. It was an educational show, but there's plenty of those. It's a puppet show, but that's not new. It's a singing show, but lots of shows have singing. Today's special was a dancing show. Other shows might have guest dancers from time to time, but having a talented dancer like Jeff Hislop front and center every episode meant dancing would be a premier language for the show. Most of the show was shot on multiple sets on a soundstage, and pretty detailed sets at that, thanks to the show's enhanced budget. 
most TV Ontario shows were limited to one fairly cheap set and tried to make up the difference with charm and education. But today's special bounced freely from the store floor, the back room, Sam's office, Muffy's house, and whatever places the characters imagined themselves being in. Also, there was a lot of outdoor scenes with Jody and Sam as they went about their day. But more than that, the show's opening and some select scenes throughout were shot at the very real Simpsons department store in Toronto. <laughs> It only happens once a year. Simpsons has it. Our biggest sale of the year. Our lowest prices of the year. Simpsons has it. Simpsons number one sale. Your number one chance to save. Simpsons has it. Simpsons number one sale. On now. So you have your money, you have your talent, you have your locations. Time to make a show. After a two-pilot test run, a 22-episode first season was commissioned. Now, for whatever reason, Roger Cable's galaxy never got off the ground. I don't know why. There's virtually no paperwork. But it wouldn't be until 1988 for Canada to get their own Nickelodeon alternative. But that doesn't matter. Today's special still got its enhanced budget. TV Ontario got its blockbuster show and the effects were immediate. While TVO had exported a few shows like the Polka Dot Door to other Canadian markets, today's special was polished enough and dynamic enough to license it worldwide. And with just the first season under its belt, today's special got the attention of the programming manager of a struggling little cable channel in the United States. Uh, Jerry Laybourne was the uh, second in charge at Nickelodeon at the, at the time, and she really liked uh, today's special. And I don't think her boss got the show, you know, but I think Jerry was pretty, pretty adamant and bought today's special for, for Nickelodeon. Now, Nickelodeon isn't this, at this time, isn't this monster that it is today, this phenomenal enterprise owned by Viacom and, and whatever. It was a fledgling cable network in the United States, but I mean, there was a time when uh, the number one show on Nickelodeon was, uh, you can't do that on television out of, out of CKOH in Ottawa, and then eventually Nickelodeon produced it themselves, and the number two program was Today's Special. What's new? Today's special, that's what. Now you can see brand new episodes of your favorite show with Jody, Jeff, Muffy, and Sam. Watch today's special Monday through Friday at 8.30 Eastern, 5.30 Pacific, and at 2 Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. It's hot off the presses. Nickelodeon grabbing today's special was a no-brainer for where it was in 1982. It was aesthetically aligned with shows like Pinwheel and Dusty's Treehouse. It was made for a commercial-free station, which made it easier for Nick to plan around. It had a mime, and it was more focused on social education than teaching kids their ABCs and 123s. Even following a PBS You Pay For model, even with a bunch of electric company alumni on staff, the educational aspects of early Nickelodeon were learning about the world in general and how we interact as people. Social education. Today's special fit that MO perfectly, and took it to some interesting places as more seasons were produced. Consider the Season 4 episode, Butterflies. Muffy is excited to witness the passing migration of monarch butterflies. One of these butterflies, an older one named Hazel, voiced by Nikki Tilro, lands on the roof of the store to get some rest. And Muffy offers to bring air inside. Hazel gets to meet the other characters, we learn a bit about butterflies, and we segue into defining shapes. And then, right at the end of the episode, this happens. Jeff was so thoughtful to get this box, and I love the way Jody did my name. Oh, I'm glad you're delighted, but me, I'm excited. You are? How come? Well, Jeff and Jody said okay when I asked them if you could stay. You don't have to fly away. You'll get better, and then we can play. That would be wonderful, Muffy, but... But what? I'm not going to get better. I'm dying. You're dying? You're lying! No. I told you I'm old. And it's time for me to die. That's all there is to it. But I'll always remember you, Muffy. And Jeff, and Jody. <laughs> and Sam with his, his silly net. 
You've all been such good friends. Oh, oh Hazel, no. Oh. 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 That's right, kids. You thought this was going to be an episode about butterflies, but it's actually an episode about death. Well, it's one-fifth of an episode about death. It's worth pointing out that this episode aired a year after the much-praised Mr. Hooper episode on Sesame Street, which devoted the whole hour to help children understand and come to terms with death as a concept. Butterflies tries to hit some of the same ideas, but it doesn't ease you into it and it spent so little runtime on it that I'd imagine that most children in the audience were too stunned to be educated. Still, it was attempting something that most preschool shows never attempted, so credit where credit is due. An episode that does spend its rung time on a heavy subject is the season 6 episode, Phil's Visit. Jody's castle display is being photographed by the world-famous Phil Finelli, played by Gary Parks, aka Doc from Fraggle Rock which was also being shot in Toronto and had some cast and crew crossover with today's special. Now, Phil is also an old sailor friend of Sam, and when the two catch up, Phil suggests they have a drink. Remember that silver flask I used to carry? Mm, Well, what do you say to a drink for old time's sake? A toast to the Ida Bell. No, actually, dear, I'm going to have to say no thanks a lot. As a matter of fact, if you've got alcohol in that flask there, I must tell you that we don't allow drinking of alcohol in the store. It's a store policy. So I'd appreciate it if you just kind of put that flask back in your pocket again. Yeah, well, well, say no more, Sam. Just lead the way to the children's department. This is an episode about alcoholism, and specifically recognizing the toxic behavior of alcoholics. Phil initially hits it off with Muffy and invites her to be his assistant, but he can't stop pulling out that flask, and is soon very drunk and mean, and directs a great deal of abuse at Muffy. As the adult in the room, it's up to Sam to stop things. Oh, I guess I owe an apology. Where is the little sweetheart? I better set things right. The apologies won't set things right, Phil. You've got to stop drinking. Besides, I'm... I'm not sure that Muffy cares to see you again, and frankly, neither do I. I want you to pack your things and then get out of the store. Now. The show recognizes that no amount of preschool moralizing can really help in a situation like this. Phil can't just apologize and make this better. And instead, the show says, hey, sometimes the only thing you can do is remove toxic elements from your life. It's surprisingly sophisticated, and it avoids most of the problems I attributed to butterflies. The episode has a framing device where Jody, cleaning up the mess Phil caused, lets us know what this episode is going to be about right at the beginning. You're not surprised by it, and therefore, you can learn from it. For my money, this is today's special's masterpiece, but I'm starting to make this show sound darker than it usually was. Let's roll back to season 5 with the episode, Hello Friend, in which Jeff and friends meet Levy, a real boy with cerebral palsy. He can't speak, and so communicates through bliss symbols, a ideographic writing system. We then spend the episode learning about bliss symbols, which is a fairly obscure alternative communication method for the disabled. Kids shows that talk about sign language and braille are all over the place, but this is quite possibly the only kids show to feature bliss symbols. All right, there's the symbol for mouse, uh-huh. which you already got. Mm-hmm. Now the next symbol means meeting. Two arrows meeting each other, so it's something you say when you meet someone. Oh, I know, hello. Hi, <laughs> Muffy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now let's look at the second word. A uh, person. Okay, and then the heart means feeling, uh-huh. and the next two symbols mean good. So, it's someone you feel good about. Uh, a friend. I know. The message says, Hello, friend. Plus, you're showing kids how very normal and human people with disabilities are, and that's always a good thing. Though, within the fiction of the show, why is this poor kid in a closed department store at 3 a.m.? 
Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, uh, Today's Special had a live stage show that they filmed as an episode, which could have been the series finale. That seemed to be the style at the time. Pinwheel also ended production after a touring live show. But then TV Ontario renewed it for another two seasons. Most episodes weren't big events, but Today's Special is always memorable because Today's Special is... Well, I'd call it a slightly off-center program. It doesn't quite gel, but in an interesting way. For example, the three main puppet characters are completely different in design. They're made of different materials, they emphasize different parts of the body and face, they move differently. Like, yeah, there's a lot of variety in Sesame Street, but they all kind of have the same core design to them. Each episode has one or two original songs. The show almost never used pre-existing music. The only exception I noticed was in their Christmas episodes. And they almost never repeated songs. Clive Vanderberg wrote virtually all the music, which put him equal to George James in terms of overworked composers. Occasionally, the show had on children's music group Sharon, Lois, and Bram. And they weren't allowed to play their own music for the show because it all had to be original, dang it. Side note, Sharon, Lois, and Bram would get their own show in 1984, and that show also ended up on Nickelodeon, so stay tuned for that. I'm not saying this stuff doesn't work. With a stronger lesson plan, larger budget, and tighter scripting, I actually think today's special holds up better than Pinwheel. But the high rate in which the material needed to be produced for such an oddball group of characters for such a silly premise means the show is just a little bit off the rails at all times. When I asked people what they remembered about today's special, they didn't really bring up any episodes, but singular moments. Oh, that time Sam sprayed whipped cream all over the place. Oh, what about that time they went into a video game? Wasn't there a marching band that would parade through the store from time to time? Oh, remember when Sam and Jody went to a police station and got really excited over one of the cops shooting their guns? Now get out of her way. <laughs> Look at that! A bullseye! Right Great. in the center, Jody! <laughs> Yikes. Anyway, today's special is a great show with some amazing episodes. In my opinion, about half a head better than Pinwheel. But it is undeniably an odd show that you expect to see one of those no-context Twitter accounts for. Now that's not a bad thing. I love how off the walls the show could get. It's like a blind bag. You never know what you're going to get. After seven seasons and 121 episodes, though in fairness, four of those episodes were clip shows, today's special ended production in 1987 though it continued to run its syndication for a long while after. Nickelodeon aired Today's Special until 1991, and it also aired on several PBS markets. And I couldn't possibly tell you how long it reran in Canada. It might still be going in Canada. Which is good, because that's the main reason Today's Special has been preserved as well as it has. In 1981, VHS was still a new technology, and its primary use was for films. Today's Special was the last generation of shows that didn't really factor in home video into their contracts. It's not a lost show. TV Ontario still probably has all the masters in their vaults, and in fact have uploaded a few full episodes on their YouTube channel. But the reason you'll probably never see it on DVD is because contracts would have to be reworked and a bunch of people would have to get paid. And don't get me wrong, I'm all for people getting paid. But if projected profits of a DVD set for a television show pushing 40 years old doesn't exceed the amount those people would have to be paid, it's just not happening. But since the show aired and re-aired over a decade across multiple countries, two decades in some areas, and had a very large fan base, the entirety of today's special has been preserved from home video recordings. If you want to dedicate some time to tape trading or bootleg DVDing or file sharing, you can track down every episode. For our purposes, for the purposes of building a history of Nickelodeon, Today's Special was a solid program for the roster, but it wasn't a game changer. It was a more polished version of what they were already doing. And when they decided to fade out the last surviving Schneider era shows in 1990 and 1991, Today's Special faded away with them. 
But for the history of Canadian television, and TV Ontario in specific, today's special was incredibly important. A once-in-a-lifetime intersection of public interests and big business. A creative and financial gamble that would become a worldwide success. Put some interesting Canadian talents in front of the camera, secured TV Ontario's legacy, and became a nostalgic favorite for an entire generation of children. We did 125 half-hour episodes over uh, six and a half years. Uh, we had 28 million viewers down in the States on Nickelodeon alone. I mean, it was a really a big deal for kids' programming. But does it still surprise you today? I mean, 20 years later, yeah. that people still recognize yeah. you from that show? The power of video. Yeah, absolutely. And that's pretty dang swell. We've got a store that I explore When the customers aren't here anymore We make displays for holidays And late at night when the stores close tight I can slide, I can ride Upside down, can you see me? I'd love to play through the day, but I'm a mannequin. Can you free me by singing a hocus pocus, alamogocus? Can we play it? Let's hear you say it. Hocus pocus, alamogocus. Hocus pocus, alamogocus. Got a store that I explore When the customers aren't here anymore We make displays for holidays And late at night when the stores close tight I come alive and I feel alright Whenever I hear Hocus Pocus Alamogocus Hocus Pocus Alamogocus Hocus Pocus Alamogocus Next time, Keanu Reeves and Weird Al Yankovic make some cameo appearances as we reach Nickelodeon 1983. Today's shout out goes to the YouTube channel of Travis Doucette, I think I'm pronouncing that right, where you can find interviews he did with Clive Vanderberg, Nina Coe, Bob Dermer, and Noreen Young, which form the backbone of my research. He also did interviews with a large number of other TV Ontario talents, so if you've walked away from this video interested in learning more about TVO, definitely give his channel a look. There's a link in the description. Thank you all for watching. This wraps up Nickelodeon 1982. Three years down, 37 more to go. Thanks for sticking with me and with the Pop Arena. If you'd like to support Nick Knacks and the rest of the channel, perhaps consider contributing to my Patreon. Every dollar I make keeps me financially secure and gradually improves the production values of the show. If you don't believe me, I actually had to buy some burned DVDs to get all this footage, and I wouldn't have been able to do that without the support of my amazing patrons. You can also support the channel by hitting that like button, subscribing to the channel, hitting the bell for notifications, following me on Twitter, and sharing knickknacks with all of your friends. Thanks once again, and I hope you have a wonderful day.